So welcome to another episode of Hollywood Kitchen. Recently, when actress Don Wells passed away at the age of 82, very sadly of COVID, um, I had a couple people reach out to me immediately and say, please do an episode on her. And honestly, my, my TV knowledge is nowhere near my film knowledge, but I wanted to honor her because she definitely was so beloved and a huge pop culture icon. So I recruited the awesome Dr. Annette Bochanek, who is a return guest. She also baked Janet Gaynor's pumpkin pie with me for Thanksgiving. And she knows a heck of a lot about Don Wells, about Gilligan's Island, and it's gonna be fun. So welcome, Annette. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. We're here with another pie. <laughs> yes, we're, we're on a pie making spree, which I figure is a little cheaper than a shopping spree and not as dangerous as a crime spree. So pie making spree is a good thing. I think so. And the recipe that we're gonna make today, apparently Dawn really loved food and cooking and actually wrote a cookbook about kind of based on Gilligan's Island. And I at first very naively assumed this cookbook would be very cheap and all over the place. And much to my shock, when I went on the internet a few weeks ago, it started at the time at $60 and went up to 300. So Annette, being ever resourceful, found a library copy in Chicago and sent me scans so we could we could use this recipe. So Annette, tell me how you first uh, learned about Don Wells. Like, what was your introduction to her? Well, I think growing up, I watched a lot of like classic TV sitcoms. I loved things like uh, Bewitched, I Dream of Jeannie, and definitely Gilligan's Island. Um, that was one of my, my favorite shows to see. And I vividly remember uh, just uh, being at piano lessons and trying to get that done as quick as possible so I could be home in time to catch Gilligan's Island. Um, at the time, Nick at Night uh, was airing them uh, as part of some summer programming. And I just, I loved the show uh, and the characters as well. And that is how I ran into Dawn Wells. She was, of course, one of the seven stranded castaways. And it was delightful to be able to, uh, to, to see her work. I think my first exposure to her was as a kid um, in the 70s and 80s, they would rerun Gilligan's Island a lot. And um, I remember hearing the song, the Castaway song, but I didn't remember much else for some reason. So um, when we decided to do this episode, it's kind of been a chance for me to dive into the world of Gilligan's Island and um, Don Wells over the weekend. So um, I think this is going to be a lot of fun. So I thought maybe first off we could make the pie and then when we're done, which is not hard, then we can just do our whole deep dive into our subject matter. Sounds great, yeah. All right, so um, I don't have a double broiler, which is what this calls for, but luckily I've got my trusty little hot plate and I think that will do nicely. Okay, um, over, okay, the egg yolks and salt. And you, Annette, gave me some cooking tips that not just the egg yolks and salt, but also I think you said to add the sugar, milk, and butter pretty soon, so it's not like just making scrambled eggs. Exactly. Yes. Yeah. My only worry was that the eggs would just burn or turn into scrambled eggs, so I would just put it all together if you don't have the double boiler. Yeah, because I accidentally burned coconut this morning while. <laughs> <laughs> Oops. If there's a way to burn something, I will find it, Sarah. Yes. Okay. So we're gonna put the eggs in here. All right. So this is three eggs that I have separated the egg yolks from the egg whites. We have the dash of salt. Okay. And we're going to go ahead and put in the um, sugar, milk, and butter. Okay. Here's the sugar. There's the butter. And it calls for three cups of milk. So I will get that started. And uh, what temperature did you, did we decide to have this on on my hot plate? Because it goes up to six. I think we did like a medium, like I think we did like a four, I believe last time. Yeah. Okay. And that's what I will go for then. Yeah, this is, it's been really fun learning about her. In fact, um, 
one of the things that I love about YouTube is you can just kind of go down a rabbit hole and just get lost in different yes. miscellaneous things. And this morning I found a bunch of interviews with her on YouTube and I was watching those and um, you really get a sense of her personality offset. Like she seemed to be a very um, humble person who was just really grateful for, for what she had and seemed to be really charming. Like you really, she really came across as just a lovely person when you kind of see all of her interviews and what she had to say. Yes, on screen and off, I think, uh, yeah, she was genuinely grateful for the, the opportunities that Gilligan's Island afforded her since that was her, her real first big break. She had only done a couple guest appearances on, on good TV shows, but of course, Marianne is what, what put her on the map. And I think she was very proud of that too. She was very proud of having that legacy and just being able to portray that character allowed her to connect with so many people from all over the world who saw her as Marianne. <laughs> so um, I think it's, it's a great legacy to have. Because I notice um, this always comes up when studying Hollywood history of any kind early is how actors tend to be typecast. And like once you do a certain kind of role and you excel in it, then it's so hard to convince people that you can do anything else. And I notice there are some stars like say Boris Karloff who just go, all right, I'm the horror star. Hey, not a bad gig, I'll take it. And then others who just fight tooth and nail against it. And they just want so desperately to stretch artistically or otherwise. And that's understandable completely. But a lot of them just wind up in such frustration that that's not, you know, able to happen. Definitely. Yeah. And I, I don't think that was really the case with Don Wells, though. I think she really embraced the role. She embraced uh, just how, how it allowed her to connect with people. And, you know, even though I think Marianne is the, the role, of course, that she, she would be identified with for the rest of her life, she did branch out a little bit and, uh, and devoted herself to theater. She actually did a lot of touring. Uh, she replaced Lorna Luft, actually, in uh, the musical touring version of their playing our song, um, which is interesting to me, thinking that she, she did have this whole other theatrical career that I didn't really know too much about, but she did over 100 of these live theater productions, actually, beyond her Marianne role. But of course, it's that key character that um, allows her legacy really to, I think, live on and, and let, her to, uh, let her connect with more generations of TV fans. Now, it ran for 98 episodes, right? And a total of like three years? Yeah, it was three seasons. So it started off in 1964 and it went on to 1967. And there were different spin-off versions. There are actually two cartoons that came out of the, the series. One of them was The New Adventures of Gilligan's Island, which was just an animated version of uh, really more of the same adventures without Don Wells, though. And then there was Gilligan's Planet, where they were stranded in space. And Don Wells was actually part of that as well. Uh, but uh, there were three made-for-TV films that revisited um, the, the plot of the original castaways. Uh, everyone from the original cast was there, save for uh, Tina Louise. Um, her role was played by another actress. Um, but Don Wells was in all three of those uh, spinoffs. And I think they were, I jotted down the years for myself, um, it was a rescue from Gilligan's Island in 1978, and then the castaways from Gilligan's Island in 79, and then one more film they did, uh, the Harlem Glo Globetrotters on Gilligan's Island from 1981. So, and that that was really uh, it for her appearances as Marianne uh, documented on TV or film. You know what I wonder is why it was CBS, right? It was, yeah. Why CBS pulled the plug if it was that popular? Right? That's always baffled me because usually I've noticed like in television, like Golden Girls, Family Ties, The Cosby Show, Cheers, Friends, a lot of those kind of shows, if they do well, they get long runs, you know? Like why did CBS, I wonder, just abruptly pull the plug. Yeah, it's it's too bad. And I think like ultimately the, the cards were kind of stacked against Gilligan's Island from the beginning. There's a lot of stories uh, as to how hard it was for Sherwood Schwartz to actually get this show off the ground and get the network to actually run with this idea. And I can talk about that later. But um, really, I think uh, CBS struggled with seeing how they could make this show profitable. And it ran for those three seasons. But as far as critics went, uh, no one really liked the show to begin with. However, the audiences 
did. Um, th there was a hit with viewers. It was a hit during uh, different test screenings of the episode. So they were loved um, by audiences and the, the network executives didn't really know why or understand why. But nonetheless, um, these three seasons, they, they were popular, but eventually what it came down to was a show called Gunsmoke, um, unfortunately. Uh, the Gilligan's Island time slot was given away to Gunsmoke, which required a full hour time slot and that um, that overlapped with when Gilligan's Island was being aired. And so uh, Gunsmoke was uh, a show that they wanted to get off the ground. It also happened to be the favorite show of one of the CBS executives' wives. Uh, so there was that too. And unfortunately, yeah, Gilligan's Island was sort of canceled without any fanfare. The cast members never really had a chance to say goodbye when they said their goodbyes for the third season. They were already anticipating the fourth season that was already slated to happen. And then it didn't. Hmm, shoot. Now, TV networks can be really brutal. I know CBS really mishandled Judy Garland also in the 60s and her show, which also got huge ratings too. Yes, yeah, short-lived Judy Garland show, but those generated some really fun performances. Just to see Judy alone is a treat, but some of the guest stars she brought on uh, and people she reconnected with um, from her past career and stars of the present, like Barbara Streisand. I think everyone knows that, that clip from the, the show. But um, gosh, yeah, another show that had, I think, great potential and was good entertainment. Absolutely. Okay, I'm still stirring this. It seems to be taking a while. When did it say I added in the... Oh yeah, so um, when you stir that, you're supposed to uh, have that boil. So once you start seeing some bubbles, then you should be safe to go ahead and add in it's, uh, the cornstarch. Ah, uh, okay. I'm not totally seeing bubbles yet, but it's kind of slowly, slowly okay. getting there. Soon then, yeah. Okay. And I noticed you do have pigtails in tribute to Don Wells today. Oh, yes. Yeah, absolutely. I had fun with this. I'm, uh, gosh, I, I can't remember the last time I wore, actually, last time I wore pigtails was the last time I dressed up as Marianne for like a high school spirit week. <laughs> so now I'm the, the Midwestern winter version of Marianne. <laughs> That's awesome. I am, um, I've always been into fashion, even since I was little, and I love vintage clothes, and I collect 20s to the 50s, but the 60s are a lot of fun, too, and, and watching the episodes, one thing that was fun for me is all the cute little outfits she wore and I saw in a lot of the interviews they would not let her show her belly button on network tv so anytime she's walking across the set or walking through a scene and those little short shorts sink down a little bit they had to stop and retake it she said and everything and um yeah. she's so cute and she's so tiny yeah. and I noticed she wore a lot of red gingham so I don't know if you can see it up close on the camera here but I have a red gingham 1940s house dress on. So I thought I would wear that color, that style to, to pay tribute to Dawn. Perfect. But I can definitely see how her look kind of would have been something women maybe wanted to copy or teenage girls were really interested in because it was sexy, but it was kind of wholesome at the same time. It was kind of this, she wasn't a total sex pot, but she wasn't super, she kind of fell in the middle, you know? And um, yeah, her clothes were just adorable. Yeah, definitely. It's, it's sort of funny to go back and look at these shows. And yeah, you brought up the issue of her navel. Yeah, famously, I think on the, the 60s and, and predating that, women on television did not have a navel. <laughs> oh, in movies different. too. Uh, our friend Kimberly Truler talks about that a lot in her fashion lectures, how they had to do all these dresses with cutouts or with certain things because showing the belly button on screen would have been just totally tender. <laughs> It's kind of amazing to look at that and think how different the world is now, you know, compared to very different naked dress is so popular. Like it's almost a trend to see how unclothed you can be on the red carpet. It's just the pendulum is just in such a different direction. And it's really interesting to kind of see that. Absolutely. Yeah. And definitely. And on television, we had Barbara Eden kind of fighting the same battle with I Dream of Jeannie. Um, she had those Jeannie costumes and again, always had to um, cover up the navel. Now that show I did watch a lot. In fact, I remember when I was little thinking that if I just folded my arms and blinked, I could get anything too. So I remember standing in the driveway blinking when he wanted to get my mom a new car. <laughs> <laughs> a new car did not show up, but um, 
it's just funny as a kid when you see stuff, how impressionable you can be. Oh my gosh, yeah. I can't tell you how many times I stood in the mirror trying to get my nose to wiggle in the right way, <laughs> like Samantha would on Bewitch. <laughs> yeah, I saw a short cartoon when I was a little kid and it had Jiminy Cricket jumping off a pile of books with an umbrella. And I thought, oh, I could do that. And so <laughs> my parents weren't watching, I guess. I climbed up this big mulberry tree in our backyard with an umbrella and jumped out of the tree. And the umbrella went, and I promptly just hit the ground like a huge sack of potatoes. So, yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay, it's definitely kind of starting to boil now. Great, yeah. So we'll add in the cornstarch, um, and it, it should start thickening up after that. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Oh yeah, I can tell it's definitely starting to do that. Um, Excellent. Just, all right, let's see. As soon as bottom part boils, mix cornstarch. Okay. Add egg yolk mixture a little at a time. Or you do that. Oops. Um, okay. Yeah, you're just gonna keep whisking it basically until it turns into like pudding. <laughs> like I don't think this totally is like I have to put certain. I don't know that the order is that important at the end of the day. Yeah, I don't think so. I think we're kind of freewheeling a little bit without the double boiler here, but it's it's going to be delicious. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Hopefully I will not mess it up. Um, I do want to point out the other night, um, Annette and I were doing a test episode, which I always do a, a private like Zoom test a day or two before of all these recipes, just to make sure I have some idea of what I'm doing. And um, I every episode, I can honestly say I've learned something. I've gone, wow, I didn't know this or that. And the other night I struggled with meringue. Yes, I had meringue problems because I've never made meringue before. And apparently you're supposed to whip up the egg whites with a little bit of sugar and beat it with an electric beater for like five minutes. I did this and it didn't work. So I guess I naively assumed I just keep adding sugar and adding sugar and adding beating time. And Poor Annette has so much patience, thank you, because I sat here forever like trying to frenzy, in a frenzy, whip up the meringue and it just wasn't working. Um, I called my friend Mary Stanford, who's basically my life and cooking tech guru. And uh, she sent me a whole article about meringue. I had no idea meringue was this complicated of an issue. Yes, it can be pretty picky. Yeah, I, I too had adventures in meringue. I decided to give it a try last night and <laughs> yeah, it, it wasn't perfect, but it, it was something. <laughs> Your meringue turned out really, really well because you sent me pictures. I think in the last analysis where I went wrong, I don't think the egg whites sat out. <laughs> it's starting to... Ooh, maybe I don't think the egg whites sat out long enough and I also think that, um, why, okay, a little bit of this is leaking out of the pan and then burning and then making smoke. Okay, I'm just gonna, all right. Maybe turn down the heat a little bit. Yeah. That's just... um, what was I gonna say? Oh yeah, so um, I think I didn't leave the egg whites out long enough. I think constantly adding more sugar was probably also a mistake. So. I think after, I'm not going to do it on camera here because it would probably be super annoying to just have to sit through me because my mixer is so loud, but I'm going to try it later and give it a second shot today and see if I can make it work. Yeah, I think my, my solution was just to beat the egg whites alone if you go that route um, and then add in maybe like a little spoonful of sugar, but then it started really, really duplating for me. So I'm sure it's user error on my part. You can also go the, the Cool Whip or whipped cream route <laughs> as well. Well, some of these things are tricky. Like I have a few souffle celebrity recipes and I'm a little nervous to try a souffle because I've always heard those are really tricky. Okay, it's still thickening. This seems to okay. take a bit of time for this to happen. And uh, let's see. I guess like interestingly, since you mentioned fashion, another kind of cool thing that I found was that uh, the Marianne character, so Don Wells plays this Marianne Summers character who actually, um, she won the, the three hour tour. So that's why she's on the boat with them and why she's uh, stranded. But she's a farm girl from Winfield, Kansas. And she's actually supposed to be kind of a light allusion to Dorothy Gale from The Wizard of Oz. We see her from Kansas. Um, she's there in her, her pigtails, her braids. Uh, she wears gingham as well. She kind of channels that sort of 
wholesome Dorothy-esque image. And I think that's reflected a little bit too in the fashions. I can, I can see it. I can see where they're coming from, sort of a more updated 1960s version of that Dorothy character, I think. Yeah, and it's really amazing how influential fashion can be on the character too. I mean, I think so many times, and Kimberly again always points this out in their lectures that I think early in film, the attitude was it's just clothes and people didn't think about it. But I mean, it just shocks me when she reminds us all that, you know, they didn't even have a costume design Academy Award till like the late 40s, I think like 47, 48. It's just shocking that it took that long for them to recognize what an art form costuming can be. Absolutely. Because it really is so incredibly influential on a character, on the development, on the story, on so many things. Yes, it really is, yeah. I read somewhere too that Don Wells later in her life actually had a line of clothing that was for seniors with disabilities. Yeah, yeah, so it was called the, the Wishing Wells, I think, Foundation. Uh, and yeah, it was for um, individuals with limited mobility. She, um, she had a line that created uh, clothing that would better accommodate situations like that. I think that is really, really cool. I love that. And another thing about her when I read about her that she seemed to be very devoted to charity, including many animal charities. So what I'm gonna do at the end of this episode, I can't remember the URLs on my own here, but I'm gonna post them on my blog and on the Facebook page. That way, if anybody wanted to honor Dawn and donate to any of these charities, I think that would be really lovely. And I'm sure her friends and family would approve. Yes, I think that'd be a wonderful way to continue celebrating her legacy and her work. Well, that's one thing too that I'm always striving to do like with my cemetery tour that I do also is kind of make people see a celebrity in a different way, you know, because I think oh, there's so much more to people than just the character they play. I mean, there's so much more into someone's life and someone's interests. And again, it's really inspiring to know that she designed lines of clothes, that she you know, even hosted, I think, like a talk show thing in Australia that she was into animals. There's so much more to someone, you know, and um, yeah, it's, it's really fun to kind of delve into that. Yeah, she really did do a lot of those charity organizations, and I really like that she championed some of the other charities that her fellow Castaways cast members were part of, too. Um, I know with Bob Denver, uh, who played Gilligan, there was the Denver Foundation that he and his wife Dreema set up, and uh, Don Wells did a lot of appearances and a lot of work to help support that. Um, that charity. Uh, and there were several others. She was involved in another one um, for the state of Idaho. I think it was to, uh, to offer, I guess, like more opportunities for employment and just to um, help stimulate their economy. She created, um, gosh, I wrote it down for myself here. Oh, the um, Idaho Film and TV Institute. Um, she was one of the founders for that, just to create jobs. And I like this too. Um, she helped uh, found the Idaho Spud Fest, which is a film festival for family-related movies. So another just like fun way that she she kind of gave back a little bit. Yeah, definitely. Okay, I think it's it's not super thick, but it is definitely getting there. So do you think it's okay to add the coconut and vanilla at this point? Um, I would give it maybe like uh, 30 more seconds or so here. Okay. And then, yeah. And we were talking about the other night, um, this does yield a lot. So if you have leftover and you decide to make this, you can always have coconut pudding too, which I think we both did the other night. Yes. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Yeah, mine, I used like a standard like nine inch pie pan. I used a pre-made one that I could just pop in the oven and then uh, <laughs> then fill up with the, the coconut cream here. But yes, I had a little bit more leftover. So it's, it's really actually what, what we're making right now is great as a standalone kind of coconut pudding. So that is also lovely. <laughs> you know what would be even fun? I always like to think of fun things we can do when the pandemic's over. Like if you got invited to like a summer pool party, this would be a fun cold pie to serve. And yeah. maybe you could even garnish it with like a lime twist or fruit or like stick a little mini umbrellas in it. Or you could even make the coconut and just use it as a pudding for like, you know, again, a summer picnic or party, pool party, whatever. 
Definitely. Yeah. And if you didn't want to turn the oven on, you could go with the pre-made route and instead of meringue, do like a whipped topping, something like that. And yeah, you'd have a, a cool dessert, I think. <laughs> okay. I think it's probably okay to add. Yeah, that's looking good, I think. Okay, we're going to add one cup of coconut. Coconut. Yum. And one half teaspoon of vanilla extract. Mmm, it smells so good. It's so good. <laughs> yes. Well, we can actually probably just talk about a lot of this while I'm doing this because it's pretty, you know, it doesn't require tremendous concentration. So um, what are some of your favorite episodes like of the show and which ones do you think best kind of highlight Dawn? Oh, that's a good question. I, I have so many episodes that I, I just love. Um, but I think as far as the ones that, that really highlight Dawn, um, there are a couple that stand out to me. Um, one of them is called The Second Ginger Grant. Uh, and that's a fun one uh, where Marianne, I think she sustains like some sort of an injury where um, she wakes up from, I think she hits her head uh, and she thinks she's Ginger Grant, who is her fellow female castaway on the island and kind of a foil to her. Um, so Marianne's like this wholesome farm girl and Ginger is this movie star uh, and uh, Marianne is always kind of uh, she is, she's always quite the opposite of that, but uh, this time around, yes, Marianne thinks that she's her. So it's a fun way for Don Wells to kind of portray the Ginger Grant character and have two gingers sort of running around in, in that particular episode. All um, right, I think we're ready to pour this in the pie pan. Uh, looks great. <laughs> Yeah, there's another fun one uh, that's called Don't Bug the Mosquitoes. <laughs> and uh, that one actually stems from uh, just popular music at the time. There are a lot of really like kind of popular like 60s girl groups and boy groups as well. And uh, there is like a boy band essentially that finds themselves stranded on the island with the castaways and it inspires the ladies on the island to uh, create their own group so the the boy group is the the mosquitoes i believe and then uh the girls they call themselves the honeybees and were treated to a performance near the end of the episode with um don wells tina louise and then natalie schaefer um, doing their their best impressions of a 60s sort of rock girl group <laughs> Let's see, I think um, maybe now we can open the floor, see if people have comments or questions and um, want to chat. Um, I think Donna Hill had a cooking comment here as well. So I'm going to, um, it's not popping up at the moment, but I'm going to look for it because Donna is also a great cook. Let's see. Um, I know a lot of you out there met Don because she was very active in going to, um, like all sorts of fan events, et cetera. So if anybody has any memories of meeting her or stories about her or wants to share, we would love to hear them. So please uh, send us, send them, your, send them our way. Yeah, absolutely. I think it's it's so refreshing to um, to see someone like Don who really embraced the legacy of Marianne. I know for me that that made a huge impact to be able to to meet her. Um, I was actually lucky enough to see her when she visited Chicago. I think it must have been two years ago now. It was one of the autograph shows that would come into town where um, there'd be a mix of different like old Hollywood stars or um, television stars that would come by and uh, Don was uh, at one of those. And and it was surreal just to see her. I mean, she was someone who is just so beloved, I think, by fans really all over the world. And she loved to connect with them. Uh, there's lots of stories. Um, that she would relate in her interviews uh, and in different, I think there's, there's a docudrama, which I can talk about in a moment too, where uh, people would think of her as Marianne. She would board a plane or a bus and uh, they would recognize her instantly. And there would be, of course, some jokes about maybe a, a three hour flight um, since, you know, it would allude to the three hour tour. Uh, but I think she was someone who always uh, just approached that so well and was genuinely grateful to meet with fans. So um, yes, I have a, a picture with Don Wells and it's, it's a beloved memory for me to be able to, to see someone who brought me so much joy and continues to bring me so much joy uh, with these, these episodes and with her legacy. Can you send me that picture? I'd love to post it yeah. on the blog and absolutely. post it on Facebook. Absolutely, yes. 
And I'm sure I'm not alone in that story. I mean, she was someone who, as I mentioned, she was very active in promoting the Gilligan's Island legacy. I think the most out of all the different castaways. Um, definitely Bob Denver would travel a bit, Russell Johnson, who portrayed the professor, uh, and the ones who, who are long gone. Um, Alan Hale Jr., he loved being the skipper, uh, and uh, Natalie Schaefer um, actually got the role of Mrs. Howell on a fluke. Um, she didn't intend to be in a television show at all. She just wanted the, the free trip to Hawaii for the pilot. And to her shock, she, she went, the show was actually picked up. Uh, but it's, it's great. It's great to see her honored. Um, Benjamin says he thinks he saw her costume at the Hollywood Museum. Yeah, actually, the, the gingham outfit, I think there's like the red gingham top and the, the shorts. I think those sold at auction a couple years ago now. And uh, yeah, so, so they were out there. Um, they were actually owned by Don Wells uh, for a little while until she auctioned them. Uh, Ger uh, Benjamin is saying, I remember Gilligan's Island series as a cartoon show on German TV when I was a kid. Sure. I believe it. Yeah, there are those two like cartoon spinoff versions of Gilligan's Island. And yeah, it's a show that was, I think, really uh, embraced uh, definitely within the US and, and beyond. And it was one of those that became really popular through syndication. That's where a lot of these characters connected with audiences long after the show was canceled and still continue to do so. Um, yeah, which does bring about the, the sad fact that um, residuals were not really a thing. None of the castaways really made money off of the re runs. So it's also partly why we see a lot of books out there um, that, that they may have written about their experience uh, working on Gilligan's Island and why they did a lot of these different appearances. But all in all, I think they're, they're still beloved, <laughs> definitely. You know, I was going to ask you, I can't remember off the top of my head, what year did residuals become a thing? You know, I don't really know offhand. I think it, it must have been, well, Gilligan's Island was, it ended in getting close to the late 60s. I think not long after that, though. Um, yeah, I don't know a definite year, though, sadly. Uh, oh, yeah, Barbara, Barbara Boyd Doss is making a comment that did occur to me while watching some of these. Mm -hmm. As a kid, I always wondered how they had so many clothes on the island when it was only a three hour tour. <laughs> yes, definitely. I think, yeah, and, and reading up on that, I think there are a lot of situations like that where you really have to suspend your disbelief as a viewer. There are a lot of different kind of like tropes that inspire these episodes. And when it, what it really boils down to is that the plots are borderline cartoonish, which, which makes total sense that the show would live on as a cartoon in some capacity. I mean, it's, it's good family entertainment. And actually, one of the issues that Sherwood Schwartz had with the network um, in trying to pitch Gilligan's Island, which was rejected three times, actually, he just kept trying to get his foot in the door there, um, was the fact that the network didn't think that he had enough material to work with in order to even make a show. So he took it upon himself to just write out a long list of different scenarios and plots that he had in mind again kind of cartoonish and come up with these situations that eventually evolved into three seasons worth of material and would have been more uh gosh so um yeah so it's really interesting to, to see and the other issue actually was that um the network didn't think that um people would care about the same castaways over and over again they actually wanted the the cast members to rotate um which is something that didn't happen we had our seven core group members on the show and actually later on we got the love boat which sort of did that actually instead we got some variation in guests but um so hence the theme song came about which introduced us to the characters over and over so you could dive in at any episode without really missing a beat you'd know exactly who everyone was and the fact that they're probably not getting off the island <laughs> yeah from what i know about sherwood schwartz he was such a determined guy like he never let no stand in his like if he got no from a network he'd go to another network he just he didn't give up on his ideas and he was such a creative person and so determined and optimistic from the research I've done on him. He was a really extraordinary guy. For sure. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I love his idea of getting uh, the, the theme song to kind of explain what's going to happen in the television show. So you don't have to go over the basic plot over and over again. And we see that in the Gilligan's Island theme song. We have the ballad of Gilligan's Island that tells us every episode what happened, why they're there, and who our core cast members are. And you see it again in another Sherwood Shorts creation, The Brady Bunch. Um, so that has a theme song that explains everything right off the bat. And a lot of other television shows uh, do that too. And that's something I think we've lost over time. I can't really think of many TV shows today that you know have a theme song that kind of catches us up with everything that's happening, which is interesting to see how television has changed. 
Yeah, and another thing in uh, researching the Gilligan episode was, okay, this was like a cartoonish, fun, kind of fluffy, lighthearted romp. And, you know, is the 60s were, of course, so incredibly turbulent with so much happening in the world at that time. Well, it's that way now, too. But I think that the show kind of gave people quite literally an escape you know, to a fun, tropical, wild place. And I think that was probably also a big part of the appeal, just getting out of your head and getting out of your current circumstances, whatever they may be, and sort of being able to go into this world with these characters. Definitely. Actually, um, one of the, the moments where reality kind of slipped in on these characters was when they were filming the pilot for Gilligan's Island. Uh, they were actually off in Hawaii shooting this pilot when they received the news that JFK had been shot. Uh, so that halted production for a little bit and then they went and filmed the rest of the pilot but you know no one was really in the mood for comedy and flying back from Hawaii to home was was difficult because now they were facing this huge um, huge moment in culture. Yeah it's always interesting to take a broader look at not just a show or a movie but kind of what was going on in the world at that time because I mean history of course never happens just in a vacuum there's so many things that influence and reflect so many other things. Sure. And uh, yeah, this show is definitely, definitely stands the test of time and continues to, to flourish today. And uh, let's see what some other uh, fans are saying here on Facebook. Let's see. Danny Miller saying, I'm wondering if the Gilligan's Island gang had good contracts that profited from decades of reruns. Oh, we talked about that. Yeah, they really yeah, didn't. Exactly. Really cool. no. That is really an incredible shame, mm -hmm. actually. And uh, Doug Grieve is saying Don was the only one that had residuals in their contract. I think that's rumored. Unfortunately, I don't think it was true for Don. Yeah, it's a sad reality though. I mean, you think how much they would have profited from residuals. Yeah, definitely. Uh, Terrence is saying that aside from Nurse Wendy on ER and Emma Peel on The Avengers, I think Marianne may be the biggest TV crush I ever had. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. He's probably, honestly, you're probably not alone. Actually, of all the castaways, Marianne received the most fan mail. Uh, so she was uh, one that fans really loved and uh, she definitely attracted a lot of um, children who would write to her character. Um, she got a lot of marriage proposals too <laughs> via fan mail. <laughs> So uh, it, it's, it's interesting to see her approach that and, and be a good sport about it. But yes, she, she received the most mail. And you know, another thing about her too is she met, might have been one of the more relatable ones to the average person because yeah. let's face it, a millionaire, his rich wife, a movie star. I mean, the average person probably is not going to relate to what it's like to be those people. But being an average person from Kansas who wound up in this situation, that's probably something people could kind of see themselves in maybe a little bit? Absolutely, yeah. In developing this show, I think Sherwood Schwartz really wanted it to resemble just sort of a social microcosm. He had a variety of different social classes and, um, you know, uh, careers represented in the shows. And yeah, I think Marianne and definitely all the castaways are relatable in, in some <laughs> facet typically, but Marianne probably most of all. I mean, she's sort of the, the general kind of girl next door character. She could be your best friend uh, probably in real life. Uh, and, you know, Don Wells was kind of like that off the screen too. She was just as sweet and genuine as the Marianne that we see on screen. But definitely, I think there are certainly relatable aspects to Marianne. And even with some of the characters like the Howells, even though um, they're portrayed as these uh, very eccentric millionaires, there's still a lot of fun. There's still aspects of them that, that humble these characters and make them still lovable. Definitely. And uh, let's see if we have any more questions rolling in here. Sure. Um, let's see. Benjamin points out that Don was an almost for every TV series. He watched from Love Boat to ALF to Baywatch and all these American TV shows he grew up with. And it, one thing that really does amaze me is when I've been lucky enough to go to other countries, how influential American TV still is. Mm -hmm. Like my very first trip to Paris, I got really sick when I first got there and I spent like a day in bed in my hotel. 
and I was watching TV and almost all of it was American stuff. Like there was Dallas and like Dynasty, Beverly Hills 90210. All, and I was just like, okay. It was just, it was so strange to me that, that those shows would be relatable to people in other countries, other languages, you know what I mean? But yeah. they were, I mean, it was just, it kind of blew my mind to be honest. Yeah, and, and it still, it still is to this day. I connect with that a lot with my mom, actually, since my, my mom is from Poland. She immigrated to the States in the 80s, and um, she knew Laurel and Hardy from Polish TV as Flip and Flop, so, like, we, we, we watch that all the time in my house, and um, I've been watching the Little House on the Prairie TV show since that's something that I totally missed the boat on, and my mom recognized Michael Landon from Bonanza, which was huge in Poland, actually. Oh, wow. so, Interesting. And Don Wells was on Bonanza, so um, she probably saw her on there, too, at some point. Yeah, it's just so, it's so neat to me how these kind of shows can travel the world and still be embraced and related in other languages, other countries, other cultures. It's, it's really kind of amazing, actually. Yes. And um, it's fun, too, because sometimes people think that's how Americans really live sometimes. Like, I remember when I was a little girl, my dad went on a my dad worked in aviation for a long time. He went on a business trip to Paris and around Europe. And when he told people he was in Dallas, Texas, people would say, well, you must know JR and Sue Ellen. And my dad's like, that's not how 99% of us live, actually. But the perception was that if you're from Texas, you know what I mean? I think some people just connected Dallas to, to that show. But it's, it's really just fun to see the, the cultural influence. It's too funny. And yeah, beyond uh, the, the culture here, um, some people would write in uh, to the, the show and to the castaways thinking they were actual castaways that were stranded and entertaining us. Uh, so that was not the case, thankfully. But <laughs> Can you imagine the fan mail the people that starred in the X-Files must have gotten? Oh gosh. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Hey there, I saw an alien last night. I need you to come out and investigate it. <laughs> so funny. funny. Oh my gosh. But that's kind of how Dawn Wells was getting her early start. She was Miss Nevada, I think, in 1959. She competed in the Miss America pageant. And she did land a few, like, minor roles, but on some important television shows, which led her to become Marianne. But um, I think it's funny, too. One of the uh, people who was also competing for the part was Raquel Welch. So we would have had a very different Marianne, too. <laughs> oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Well, I don't see any other questions popping up here. Yeah, that, um, our second video too. I think I might have seen some when we, we came back. <laughs> did you see any on the second video? I thought I did. Um, let me... yeah, let's see if we have any more questions. Let's see. I, I know someone back there asked about uh, the, the theme song and how the um, Marianne and the professor were, were labeled as the rest uh, near the end of the theme song. So uh, basically uh, the theme song would go through its verses that would tell us the plot of Gilligan's Island, then we'd get our introductions and everyone would be named except for Marianne and the professor and that they would get to their part in the song and just and the rest and it's just two people. So why not name them? Uh, but yeah, actually um, Bob Denver who was playing Gilligan advocated for them to be billed and to have their characters named. Uh, his contract actually stipulated that he could um, choose uh, his, his credits and how he was being billed and when he was being billed. Uh, and so he decided to be billed along with Marianne and the professor and just say that I'm the rest too. And the executive said, well, you know, you're the star. Like, why would we do that? Uh, and uh, he, he decided um, that he was going to insist upon that until they would actually take on the expense of adding, <laughs> updating the theme song to, to credit these characters and cast members. So I think that's really, really classy. <laughs> and uh, It's great to, to have them named. Well, they all seem to have gotten along really well, too. Like, when you watch it, it looks like they're all having fun. Like, you can't sense any sort of tension, or there's no stories that I know of, really, about battles on the set or anything. I mean, they genuinely seem to all have good chemistry with each other. Yeah, definitely, definitely. And another thing I was just thinking about, you know, you mentioned the sort of the parallels a little bit with uh, The Wizard of Oz. Well, the first season was black and white, and then the last two were color. So that actually just occurred to me as well. Uh-huh. Yeah, yeah, that's a good point. And, and I'm glad the show made it to color. I, I mentioned it's, it kind of has these cartoony plots. So, so why not have it in color? I think, uh, and especially with the costumes, we see what Mrs. Howell alone is wearing and Ginger Grant, some of those gowns and outfits. The show is just made for color, I think. 
yeah, in the tropical environment, you just want yeah. things to be brightly colored. Exactly, exactly. And um, oh, I do see Ruth asking about the opening scene and where it was shot. Yeah, gosh, so the pilot footage was shot in Hawaii and I don't know the exact locations there off the top of my head, but then what we would see in the, the television show was actually shot in Long Beach. Um, so yes, I think um, she posted earlier at Alamitos Bay Marina, that's it. Um, so it, it is featured there in that, that theme song and those opening shots for every episode. Um, Aside from that, though, the, the show was filmed in Studio City. Um, that's where CBS um, had, had their uh, sound stages, I, I guess, at the time. And there was uh, the, the lagoon, too. Um, CBS built the castaways a lagoon a couple blocks away from the freeway, actually. Uh, but uh, yeah, they had this lagoon that they would regularly shoot, um, shoot their episodes on. And it is no more, sadly. It has been raised away to make room for some other development, sadly. But uh, yeah, all of that was um, Studio City, California, save for the pilot, which was Hawaii. And if you want to uh, binge watch or catch up on any of the Gilligan's Island, I actually went to YouTube and you can just rent them either yeah. by the episode or by the season on YouTube. Perfect, yeah. I'm, I've got the DVDs here too. <laughs> so um, I think, uh, yeah, they're, they're out there. All the episodes are commercially available. It's just the three seasons. And um, as kind of a bonus, so I really love like biopics and docudramas. And um, this came out a couple years back now. I think um, it, this must've been the early O's. It's Surviving Gilligan's Island. Uh, but uh, it's sort of unique in that it includes um, interviews with Don Wells, Bob Denver, and Russell Johnson, but it also kind of slips into this docudrama where they, they talk and they reminisce about what happened in the series, and then it's actually performed with um, characters who are playing them in the 60s, and I think it's, it's really well done. It's, it's pretty nice, and Sherwood Schwartz is in there, too. Oh, cool. Yeah. <laughs> well, this has been a lot of fun. Um, after we log off, I'm going to try to my second attempt at meringue, and I'm thinking maybe I should do another attempt at toasting coconut because this, I don't know if it would, if I should say it's pan seared or blackened or if just I burned it is a better way of saying it. <laughs> and you, you don't have to toast the coconut either. <laughs> this, is true. this is true. <laughs> but, um, well, thank you all so much for tuning in. This was a lot of fun. So maybe periodically we should do episodes. I should do like a different classic TV show every once in a while just to kind of mix it up and add some variety here because there's certainly an endless well of content. I know that there's a Golden Girls cookbook. There's a new I Love Lucy cookbook coming out. So it just, the possibilities are endless. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and the Marianne cookbook is definitely a fun one if you purchase it or get it from your library. I think a lot of love went into that one. We get some of Donwell's family recipes, some of the other castaways contributed recipes. Of course, you have Marianne's famous coconut cream pie, but there's actually a whole coconut cream pie section named after other castaways. Um, so you could feel free to, to dive into some of that as well. So it, it's a great little, um, little book to, to pursue. <laughs> Yeah, I think you can get it on what, eBay or yeah. books or your library or. Exactly. Yes. And yeah, there's a lot in there. <laughs> a lot of tra tropical flair. <laughs> Excellent. Well, this has been a lot of fun. And thank you so much for your patience in many fronts with this episode. I really appreciate that. And to all of you watching, again, thank you so much. And another week or two, once I get my computer fixed again. I will be back with some more episodes of Hollywood Kitchen. So thank you so much, Annette. I appreciate it. And um, again, thank you all for watching. Thank you so much for having me. All right, we'll talk soon. Absolutely, bye.